My name is Marge Kanawaki. I was born in Los Angeles in 1941, and at the age of seven months was uh, part of the forced removal of 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry who were put into U.S. concentration camps for the duration of World War II. Uh, my camp was 100 miles west of Death Valley, and uh, all of the 10 major camps in which we were in prison were uh, about the same, uh, about a mile square, surrounded by barbed wire, ringed by guard towers. Uh, there were other, there was another camp in Northern California called Tule Lake, and that was for the, what, the U.S. government being more dissident of us, and that housed those who didn't sign a lot of people in the right way. Um, that was also ringed by guard towers, but they also had uh, military tanks there. The uh, inmates were rousted every day, and uh, it was a much harsher treatment. In addition, there were what were called citizen isolation camps, and those were essentially slave labor because if you didn't work, you didn't eat. One of my uncles was in one of those camps. He was actually a conscientious objector, and that's where he ended up for the duration of the war. I think most of you are more interested in the camp here in Colorado, which is uh, called in the history books uh, the Grenada Relocation Center. The townspeople in Grenada, Colorado pronounce it that way. Almost everyone else says Grenada, but they call it Grenada. And uh, the reason that, and I'll hand these out, these are. The reason that it says Amache and this brochure is because there was the need for a postal distinction. When the campsite was established uh, just past the mall, almost in Kansas border, the town of Grenada was actually tinier, had fewer residents than our prison community. The males were going to get mixed up, and the postal people said, OK, we have a postal distinction. So somebody came up with the name Amachi, the name of a Cheyenne woman who was married to John Carlos, who was a cowbearer in the campsite, so it was in Carlos County. Amachi herself was, her father was killed in the massacre at San Pedro, which is about 30 miles away from where we were in So there is that question of moving to do kind of a historical tourism in that area. So you have Ben's Fort, you have a marching on um, This uh, brochure was put together by uh, my, my husband and me uh, with the help of a grant. And uh, so if, if you look at it, it has uh, pictures showing people with their everyday life. And, and most of the pictures actually were taken by WRA, the War Relocation Authority Photographers. As you may know, we were not allowed to take things where cameras were confiscated from us uh, in the time before we were actually shipped off to the camps. So um, a lot of the photographs are what we would term propaganda photos. Uh, but I think it, it does give you an idea of how we lived in the desert. And uh, one of my earliest Memories of Manzanar, which is um, which means apple orchard in Spanish, um, was uh, playing in the sand uh, underneath uh, one of the guard towers, and there was a soldier walking duty uh, around the perimeter, and he was holding a rifle with a fixed bayonet, and that memory, along with others that I have on camp pushed me to try and find out the truth about why we were actually uh, sent away. This was posted on telephone poles and in other public places, and that's where uh, we, we received our instructions, and what we could take. 
could only take what we could carry with us. And so um, for us, it's a, a stark reminder, you know, reading the small print of what, uh, what was in store for us. We, had, we did not know where we were going when we were going to die, nor how long we would be staying with it. So we had no idea the conditions. It was just a crapshoot, and we just uh, decided that uh, my, my mother uh, had to clothing for me and my two siblings. And, uh, we went by bus to Manzanar and lived in Target Recovery Barracks. So this was a sign that they greeted us. Manzanar War Relocation Center. And I, I should say that that term is a, one of the euphemisms that was used to soften what was being done to us. So um, I try to remind people that you should always listen for those kinds of, of euphemisms, just like collateral damage, really good. And so I, and I think that we should as much as possible speak the truth about what we do as a people to um, others who are on the, the receiving end. Um, this is a, a picture of the cemetery, and in the back of it, you can see the Sierra Nevada. And so it was, a, it was actually a starkly beautiful place, but I remind people that you don't want to look at the mountains through the park wire. This is just another one. Uh, you can see on the barracks of children playing on the tricycles. But remember that this was all a desert, and that area became a desert starting at the beginning of the last century. And their water, of course, is always such an important part of our history. And um, the area in the Owens Valley, where Mount Sinai's located, was once a very lush um, place that grew vegetables and, and uh, had uh, apple trees. And Manzanar means apple orchard in Spanish, for those of you who are familiar with the Spanish language. Um, my grandfather was arrested on December 7th. And it's the reason why I never fill out the census forms, because it's a lie that that information is confidential. All of that information was given over to what was then called the Department of War. It's now been prettied up to be called the Department of Defense. So once again, euphemism. Um, he was uh, imprisoned at a federal site for over nine months before he joined us at Manzanar. His good friend who was arrested along with him committed suicide because he was interrogated so harshly, so a la Guantanamo. So the kinds of things that we see happening today have continued to, to happen um, for um, hundreds of years, actually. Um, and the, the uh, FBI could not have known where my grandfather nor other leaders in the community were housed unless they had that information from the census. Um, census information was also used against uh, uh, errors here in the United States after 9-11. We lived in uh, tar paper covered barracks and actually the the barracks that are depicted here um, on the inside um, are much nicer. So these barracks are at Amachi. And these actually have insulation and they have brick floors at Amachi. And my mother used to always complain bitterly to me that um, the uh, barracks that we lived in at Manzanar were, were much worse. They, they were, at Manzanar, they were uh, simply covered with uh, tar paper. So virtually no insulation. We had uh, wood floors, and they were made from, the entire barracks were built out of green wood, so it shrank in the desert heat, so unseasoned wood. Uh, and uh, when it shrank, then the, the nautiles would drop out, and then the scorpions and snakes and things from the desert would come up through the floorboards, along with all of the sand from the almost daily desert sandstorms. So that's another 
memory that I have is always waking up in the morning with a grin in my mouth. And we slept on uh, army cots. And I didn't actually see a sheep until we came to Denver. And it did actually frighten me when I saw a sheep being made that you would go like this and flip it in. Um, and uh, I didn't know what it was. And so it, it actually frightened me as a child. Um, so we would sleep on these army cots and we were issued the olive green army blankets. And I uh, used to sleep with it uh, uh, covering my mouth and my nose. And then when I would wake up in the morning, my older brother and sister would call me uh, tanuki, which means a badger, because I would have this black strip across my eyes from the sand that would come up uh, to the floorboards and during the night. Um, this down here depicts what's called the Grenada Project. So the camp itself is this cross-hatched piece, which is just a mile square. But the entire project uh, contained uh, 16 square miles. And it includes the Arkansas River and the Santa Fe River. So uh, it's my belief that all of these camps were a money-making project for somebody just like privatizing prisons are money makers, just like privatizing schools you know, into charters is a money maker for somebody. Uh, I'm positive that all the camps were money makers, uh, kind of like DIA, you know, whoever owned the land before uh, made, a, made a killing over that. Um, so you always have to have a water source, or it's good to have a water source if you're trying to make money, and also a transportation source, which is the Santa Fe Railroad. Um, at Manzanar, my camp, we only received uh, milk up to the age of two. So I have uh, very bowed legs, and uh, I always used to tell my mother that uh, I probably could have been a basketball star if I had <laughs> And I also have very bad teeth, and in speaking to um, other uh, former inmates, we're about the same age as I was. We share uh, very similar health problems from a lack of nutrition. And, um, but at Amachi, the children received uh, milk when they were, there, there was no restriction that I know of. And that's because they ran dairy cattle uh, on, on this large, uh, large area. Um, there was an internal police force, that's uh, this fellow down here, as you can see, is holding a billy club. Uh, they were very patriotic. This is a, uh, I think this is a 4th of July contingent uh, parade. And uh, this is actually my favorite photo, it's on the very back. And it shows uh, a ceremony that we call uh, Obon, which is like the day of the dead for Latinos. So, uh, once a year, the spirits come back for three days, and then uh, at the end of that time, they're sent back uh, on the water. They, you may have seen photographs of uh, people. They, they build these little floating lanterns, and they write the name on it, and they send the spirits back. 